So um, I'm going to get started because I like to start on time and we'll get going here. So thanks for attending our webinar today. Uh, I'm Mark Gleason. I am joined today with Veronica Hartless. Veronica, say hi. Hi, hi everybody. That way we know your audio is working too. So we're going to show you some things that you've probably not seen before in lending and finance software. Uh, we'll briefly explain what Decisions is and why it's so much more capable than the kinds of software that lenders typically use and see in the market. Uh, we'll do a short demo and then take a look behind the scenes to illustrate how any le lender can leverage the power of Decisions for their unique business process. Uh, Veronica, I'm going to ask you this, sorry, right now, but how do our participants participate? Do they, are we using the, they can, they can uh, send us a note through that or they're not on audio, is that right? That's correct. So that we don't have the audio set up for the attendees, but you can either post a question in the chat feature or in the Q&A. So you should see that available at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Okay. So very good. Thanks for that. Mm -hmm. So um, we're going to get started. I have a brief introduction here, um, a total of about 10 uh, pages of my, my intro here. Going to keep it very light uh, for about 10 minutes. And then we're going to do a demo of a loan origination system that we built here in three days. And then Veronica is going to show you the back end of that and how we built it and how we built something new. So just as a brief uh, kind of qualifier for who I am and my credentials, I've been in the, so in the software business for over 30 years with the last 15 years in financial technology as both lender and vendor. I've been a CTO and a director of product management at both vendors and lenders. I've built servicing and origination systems from scratch. I've had hands-on experience with almost every piece of vendor software in the space. And that experience has allowed me to see literally hundreds of lending technology operations up close, under the covers, deep into the guts of the code, everywhere from the biggest bank to the tiny, tiniest of startups in every lending market, mortgage, auto, consumer, solar, online, healthcare, commercial lending, payday lending, um, at, at every credit trudge. So uh, I've definitely developed a perspective on that. So for my intro to this webinar, I'm going to show you this nice diagram that I drew up to illustrate how simple lending, lending systems really are. Okay, every loan starts somewhere from that first lead touch. I'm showing some examples here. Lead generation from your own marketing or from lead gen aggregators, brokers and realtors and mortgage, um, portals, like dealer track and route one and auto, dealers for sure in auto and also in power sports or construction equipment, point of sale at a retailer like furniture, electronics. I did a lot of work in solar lending uh, and home improvement. And the first touch there is uh, installers and contractors and of course, borrowers directly. And then those leads go somewhere for initial evaluation and routing. Sometimes they go straight into an LOS Sometimes they hit one or more of the first gates that I'm showing here. CRM systems like Salesforce, uh, in lots of uh, consumer lending especially, and also in mortgage, they need to go through some sort of lead filtering and lead buying process and rules. And in most lending, there's some sort of pre-qualification steps to determine basic eligibility before a lender spends money on credit data. Uh, and my pictures, crude as they are, try to illustrate the reality of all these processes. They almost always include software systems, human beings making decisions and judgments, and spreadsheets and documents with rules and formulas. So from that first filter, you go into your origination system. Sometimes that's a nicely automated LOS in some markets in auto and mortgage that's typically reasonably well handled for parts of the origination process. Most times in many markets, that's once again a combination of some software, some people, underwriters or others, making judgment calls, looking at stuff, and spreadsheets with the rules and the formulas. And then after you've originated the loan, it goes over to your servicing system, either an in-house servicing system or an outsourced servicer, where it lives out the rest of its life. Again, on systems with people with spreadsheets. So far, so simple. And then you have to think about these other parts around the core pieces, the other systems and data that come into every lending scenario. And these is just a small set from my experience. And then there are more people than just the ones I talked about originally involved. There's a lot of other people involved in every step of that loan's life from the borrower's touch to the audit and compliance people 
and all of those people and systems need to get connected. So you do that. You do it with unique APIs for every combination. You usually get to pay for that work to your vendors uh, or you pay some developers to do that. And then you usually have to wait for it. And then you connect all the people, which again is, uh, they ha all have unique work processes and rules. And almost every one of these interactions in my crude diagram here, uh, systems and people, people to people, systems to systems, none of those interactions know about any of the other ones. So they're, the data flows in kind of a, sometimes in two directions, sometimes just in one, but it only flows in those directions and it's usually tough to pull it all together. So even the big pieces of the core there, origination and servicing and CRM software, only have the most simplistic connections. You, you, know, you can get Salesforce to push uh, a lead to your loan origination system, but you cannot have a multi-step, multi-conversation with Salesforce in your origination system. Their APIs don't support that. Salesforce is might, but your LOS doesn't. And then the same is true of LOS to servicing. You push a loan over there, that's the end of that conversation. Uh, if you wanna tie that data together, it ties together in a data warehouse somewhere, which again is another piece of expensive software. So there's a better way, there really is, but it's just not where lenders typically look for it. So I found that better way a few years ago. Like a few people at Decisions, uh, I was a customer before I worked here. So I was the chief product officer of a really innovative healthcare lender. We needed workflow, both human and machine, that was way outside the capabilities of typical LOS and LMS and CRM software. We needed to build and execute some pretty complex rule sets where we're using a lot of unstructured data and non-standard data like healthcare procedure types. Uh, and we were pretty sure that we we're gonna have to build all that from scratch with a combination of .NET for the user facing stuff and a Java based open source rules engine. And then I found Decisions. So what is it? Decisions is a code free, completely graphical workflow and rules platform. And they, you can you don't need developers to build things. And we're gonna show you that in just a minute. You to build really strong things that lenders and finance businesses need. So why decisions for lending and finance? It automates any or all of the lending life cycle. As I was making the point through my initial slides there is uh, most of the LOS, CRM and servicing software are kind of bounded by their perspective of where the life cycle starts and end. And if you step outside that, things get complicated and you have to start building separate stuff outside that. It automates any human or database interaction. So this is the workflow piece from mobile loan applications to customer service agent workflow at, again, at any stage of the loan's life. It creates and manages any business rules from simple lead filters to really complex matrix rules and rule sets no code, no black boxes. This is what Decisions is built on. This is why I found it, because I needed to build really complex rules that had a whole bunch of variables in a lot of different ways, and I did not want to build that in Java. It integrates data from or to any other system or database. You don't need custom code. We're gonna show you this in a few minutes, how we build an integration on the fly, and that is a key piece of that as well. So there's two basic modes for decisions, end user and designer. So from this end user perspective, showing on this slide, dashboards and key performance indicators, real-time data and stats on any part of the business. Again, dashboards and KPIs are typically part of lots of different kinds of software, but with decisions, you can pull it all together on a single platform uh, and have all your KPIs and dashboards in one place without necessarily building a data warehouse outside of that. Uh, web and mobile forms without code, without separate web development tools or teams. Again, another reason I work at Decisions today is my frustration with having to do that. Uh, you know, forms know what they need to do and they're connected, so it's not a separate exercise. Portals for online applications, dealers, partners, any other web or mobile touch point. Again, on a single platform. Workflow and task management, that's the core of lending, that's the core of Decisions. Any type of queuing, any type of task routing, make it easy for anybody inside or outside the organization to understand or execute any type of task. And you can report on anything, on any device, any location. 
from the designer perspective, uh, it's visual. It's all visual designers, which we're going to show you here in just a few a couple minutes. Uh, in lending and finance, that means decisions covers the entire breadth of the business. No technical walls between origination and servicing work. No limits on where an application flow starts or ends. And more rules processing much more easily set up than any black box with full accountability and audit trails for everything that's ever done. So taking a little closer look at how we solve the problems in lending and finance. Business rules are the foundation of every business. They take on extra importance in lending because business rules in lending and finance, every one of them is connected to either and maybe or profit and compliance. Those two things can either make you money or lose you money. And every business rule needs to be followed because it's being watched so closely by so many people. Lots of rules in finance and lending still lack a completely automated structure, though. So we provide that. We, uh, we put structure around things like judgment calls and exceptions and manager overrides. Um, and then we manage workflow. So while everybody has this dream in lending of a completely paperless, completely automated lending flow, that's still a dream. It's a people business. It's still people driven in so many ways. You just need to give the people the tools to make it more, to do their jobs more quickly and easily and in a more structured fashion. Um, all those interactions benefit from having structured processes. So the kinds of things we're showing on this page here, cues and tasks, uh, the portals that I talked about in terms of being able to build things, uh, but that's part of the process. Electronic document signatures, uploading and capturing documents, and then integration. So this was the thing that mostly drove me crazy when I was a CTO is how hard it was to integrate all of these different pieces. And this is one, again, one of the reasons and one of the decisions exist and one of the things that it does better than any piece of lending software is you can integrate anything from anywhere, any data type. Uh, you can store data anywhere. You can get data from anywhere. As long as you can connect to it in some way, we can process it. So the difference between most companies and software companies saying we have an API is we have an API and then an engine that can handle it. So we can get some unstructured data and know what to do with it. That is different. Um, since I've been in the lending software business for so long, I know you can't just chuck out your LOS or your LMS or your CRM system or your accounting system and start over tomorrow. And I'm not asking you to do that, but I'm asking you to consider that you can wrap things around. You can, dis you can weave decisions into an existing structure, and this is very typically how it's used in lots of industries, not just finance and lending. So a few examples here on this page, mobile and online loan applications, portals, as I said, lead processing. That was a great bugaboo for lots of my customers when I was in the LOS business, is these things happen before, the loan, before you get to an LOS, so something had to be built outside of the LOS to do that. That was not easy. As I talked about processing, pricing, eligibility, we have several mortgage customers that use our engine for pricing and eligibility. Add-on products is really tough, again, to, to have all of the tables of rules for individual states and, all, and, and rates, that's tricky. And then the back end, things like refi and remarketing after the loan is done. This is, you know, we don't stop when the, when the loan is done. We can keep going for as long as you want to and manage every part of that. So my last slide here of the intro is we are flexible. Everybody says they're flexible, but we have a few more points about that that we think makes us more flexible. Um, you can use decisions on any browser or any mobile device. You can use data from anywhere, store it anywhere. You can deploy decisions any way you want as a pure cloud server service. You can host, host it by us, host it at AWS or Azure. You can run it in prem on premise in a company data center, which is really important in lending and finance because lots of banks and uh, regulated entities like cred credit unions and others, um, cloud solutions are tough because you're, you need customer data that sits behind the bank's firewall and you're asking for a way behind that firewall. And I know from hard experience, that's a tough ask. Uh, and you can license it any way you want, on a subscription basis or with a perpetual license. No matter what, there's never any per transaction or per account fees, which again is pretty common in lending and finance. So that's our intro. This is what we're going to do next. We're going to do a workflow and rules demo that I'm going to run through in 10 to 12 minutes. Um, 
and then Veronica is going to show you how all the magic happens. And I'm not going to read you that list on the right, but that's what our demo does. Everything on that list. We built a loan origination system that does all those things. We built it in three days. We tested it for two more and uh, just kind of tweaked it a little bit. So the, what you're going to see is the product of one week's worth of work. So I'm going to jump out of that and jump into decisions. So I'll take a breath, and if anybody has a question, you can ask. Again, I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i get started here, but uh, if anybody has any questions, just let me know. All right, so what we're looking at here, this is the, the Decision Studio, and this is our lending queue that we built here, our loan processing queue. So this is an active report built in Decisions. It does not need to be shown in this studio. I'm doing this for the sake of demoing it, not for the sake of any sort of real world example in terms of how you would display it. This report can would be in a standalone on a, as a standalone web page and we're going to show you how that works later in the in the demo in terms of how you get to a standalone page, but this I for the sake of being able to jump uh to from the front of it to the back of it easily, I'm showing you this here. So lots of things going on here. Um active tiles with all our current processes uh, KPIs for what's a waiting document. Anybody in lending knows what these queues look like. And we give you complete com capability to build any of these kinds of things. This is a very standard view for both for, for lending and finance and in many other types of businesses. So, um, the, uh, so on the right hand side here um, are is the steps that have been taken so far on any particular loan. So if I uh, click back and forth. I can see where all the steps are. So I'm going to get going here. I'm going to I'm going to go apply for a loan. So I'm going to jump out of my lender view, and this is my end user view. As I said earlier, this is a form. Uh, this is a web form. It's a mobile form. You can run it on any device. But since it's a lot harder to run this demo on my uh, phone and show it to you, I'm going to do it here. So while he types in all this information, I'm just going to point out that all the forms you're going to see throughout this process were built in our drag and drop, what you see is what you get form designer. So everything here can be customized to the very look that you're going for and to show the fields and the information that's important for you. Go ahead, Veronica. Tell okay. them about that postal service. All right, I, I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, so you might have noticed that we had the use USPS normalized at the bottom of the screen. And when he selects yes, what that does is actually makes a call out to the United States Postal Service database and reformats our address with what they have in their database. So if it's not quite written, I think he left off the street and um, you'll notice that it automatically capitalized everything, but we can easily make those calls out to the external systems, even from our UI. Now, the second form here, of course, again, he's going to fill out this information about the social security number. As he types in the date of birth, notice that he's not formatting it like a normal date, but Decisions is going to recognize and automatically reformat a date that's typed in into a date um, that's an actual correct format. You can have drop-down lists, text boxes, currency boxes. You have a lot of flexibility of the different components that you can use on these forms. So here he's entering in his gross monthly income and selecting a, a loan amount that's going to really be taken into the rules that are going to run later on to determine whether or not they're going to be approved for this loan. Now for the channel, go ahead, Mark, go ahead and talk about that channel. Yeah, I was going to talk about this. So this is not real. This is not an end user. This is a simulation for demo purposes only. We would never show this channel to a real borrower, but we do, we run rules and, and flows based on the different channels. And instead of having to set up 10 different websites to submit from so that we would pick that up, uh, we just put this little drop list on here. So this is uh, something that we use this strictly demo uh, for demo purposes. So I'm going to submit my application with all that stuff in there. As Veronica said, it matters how long I've worked at an employer and it matters how much money I make. So not unusual. And look at me, and lucky me, I have been approved. So I'm going to go review my offer. And on this page, again, this is a standard federal truth and lending disclosure page. Uh, it looks pretty simple. Again, your loan origination system can do this. Uh, building it from scratch is probably something you would not want to do, but we did this in about 30 minutes. Um, 
which includes uh, we ran through all the rules to come up with our rate. We have a, rate, a scoring and product eligibility table. We calculated the total, uh, the amount of interest and the total payments. We uh, used um, a matrix rule to determine how, uh, what the term of the loan was based on a set of other inputs. And we calculated, you did the algebra to figure out what the payment is. So again, that's not something that nobody else can do, but it's something that we can do really quickly and that you don't need to go, uh, you know, you don't really need to go call something else to do that. So we're going to upload a couple of pieces of identification here. It's asking me for a driver's license and a pay stub. I'm going to upload something that's not a driver's license first because that's what I, something I want to show you. And what that is, is this is my Harvard ID back when I went to Harvard and had a different name. But seriously, what we've done there is this message right here. That sort of looks like a driver's license. It has a picture and some text on it, but it isn't. And what we've done here is we've called Google Vision and we've taken the score that Google Vision gives us on a, on a driver's license and created this friendly message here that says that doesn't really look like a driver's license. So let's upload a driver's license and see what Google Vision does with that. So again, this is um, not something that I've ever seen any loan origination software do. I know it's doable because it's Google Vision, it's an API call, but it's not easily doable with most tools. It's easily doable with Decision. So it looks, as you see, I got a friendlier message there. I'm gonna upload my pay stub here to keep things moving. Uh, I've got a pay stub there. So Google Vision likes my driver's license. It says my pay stub looks a little fuzzy. It's got this uh, watermark stamped across my fake pay stub there. So it's fuzzy, but it's within the threshold of acceptable by Google Vision. Again, to my point earlier, humans are gonna look at this stuff. So I'm gonna upload that. And I got another message. Again, the form and the flow all generated automatically. So the application was submitted and I'm gonna step out of my borrower role and back into my loan processor role. So there's the application that just was, that got submitted in the verification documents that were received. You can see we're setting these statuses dynamically as things happen. Um, a few ways you can get to the data behind that. You can look at, you can go verify documents, you can view the credit report. Uh, I can click on this application ID link over here and get some more detail about that. As I said before, you can see everything that's happened, every step of the flow, all the documents that got uploaded, um, and everything else that's happened so far. So from here, let's go do a couple of things. So first, I wanna go view that credit report because there's something about this that a lending audience will probably appreciate. And that is, so this is a PDF version of the credit report. And you'll notice that it's not a credit report from one of the big three bureaus. Uh, every lending software uh, can get can pull data from Experian, TU, or Equifax. That's just part and parcel of what they do. Uh, you can get that, they get that XML and then have more or less capability to do something with it. We set the bar a little higher for ourselves here. We called Credit Technologies, who's a partner of ours in the mortgage business. And what they do is they do a tri-bureau merge with some value-added stuff, their score improvement services that they add. So this is not a standard credit report. It is a completely different set of XML that we had to go get. And it has, a, as I said, it's a tri-bureau merge, but we got both the XML and the PDF. The PDF's available to view, but we called a new API, a different API, not the one that, you're, that any lending software can call. So that, again, uh, for me, as a former product officer and uh, business officer in terms in the lending business, that capability to call an ex, you know, an, a value-added bureau or somebody outside of the big three is, it usually took a lot of work and a lot of time. So let's go verify those documents that our borrower uploaded. So there's my driver's license. Um, and again, all these forms are standard and built easily in decisions. And I'm gonna go send that for signature because everything looks okay to me. So what we're doing here is we are calling DocuSign and we are sending it over to DocuSign. And I've sent it out there to be, a pro to be processed and hopefully it should land in my email box. And there it is. I had one in there before, There's, there it is right there. So that is my, so it landed in my email box. And again, if you've ever used DocuSign, you know what this looks like. Uh, again, integration is simple. Again, we did this as part of what we've done, what we did in our three-day exercise to build this loan origination system. So I'll say continue to that. I'll say okay. 
So again, not uh, you know not rocket science, but again not trivial and not uh, but and not magic, which is actually a good thing and easy enough for decisions to do. Is we've you know inserted we've we've merged this document with our lender name. We took a standard t document template, put all the terms of the loan in there, and we are going to sign that document with an electronic signature. Again, you can do more with DocuSign and um, and do more with the signatures, but I'm going to keep it simple and use my standard signature and sign this puppy. So we're signing that. I finished there. I'm going to say no thanks to that. So let me go back to my lending queue here. And uh, actually in my email box, I already got back my just the fact that the thing's been signed. So what we're doing here is uh, DocuSign does not do push notification. So you have to call DocuSign. So other um, electronic signature software has push notifications. So we set up uh, a workflow task that runs in the background that every minute is going to check DocuSign to see if my document's been signed. So while we're waiting for that, I'm going to show you that, you know, we've actually got the contract here. Um, so come on, come on, DocuSign, update, up, upload my thing. So it's going to go there any second now. <laughs> Come yeah, on. so it takes just a second for DocuSign, like you said. It takes about a minute. Um, so it's just a little bit of a lag while, while we wait on DocuSign for that. Yep, interesting. Well, it wouldn't be a demo if it didn't take longer than a minute. So I'm, I'm, there, I'm, there, it there it is. Mm -hmm. I just needed me to start talking bad about it. So, right. so there it is, my status changed. Again, I didn't have to refresh this page. Again, this is all web-based, but I didn't have to refresh that page. It uploaded this status. So let's go take a look at our signed loan contract. And again, there it is, um, and that thing is signed. So that is basically the end of my flow here. So there's a ton of stuff that happened behind, behind all that, and this is where I'm going to turn it over to Veronica to show you that part. All right. So I think what I'll do, um, Mark, if you want, you can go ahead and stop sharing, and then I'll share my screen. I'm basically on the same screen, but we live on the opposite sides of the United States. So here we are um, using different computers. So Mark, could you verify that you can see my screen? I can see your screen. You can. Okay, yes. perfect. Thank you. So I'm going to start by actually going into showing us how this was all built out. Decisions, of course, is a drag and drop um, flow uh, business process management system. So when I actually go into our loan approval flow, here you can see it's really a Visio-like studio where we can literally drag and drop items, connect them together, add a couple of configures, configurations, and have a completely working workflow. So what you see here is that we've broken this into actually a few subflows. And we use these subflows, which is really just another workflow that we've linked to the current workflow, so that we're able to reuse different pieces of this project in other projects as well. We're all about being able to reuse things here in Decision. So if we're able to not have to reinvent the wheel every time, that's exactly what we're going for. But here in these black steps, these are those subflows I was just mentioning. So I'm going to actually jump into the first gather application. And here, inside this workflow, you're going to notice that right in the very beginning, we have a couple of forms. These were those forms that Mark was filling out right when we kicked off that demo. So we saw the first form where we entered in the name and the address information. The second form that we saw was entering in the, the, their monthly gross income and selecting how much of a loan that they want to apply for. And then the blue steps are really just administrative steps. We created a borrow in the database and saved that, that information that was entered in on the forms to that database. From there, once we gathered the applicant data, then we went into another subflow and what we called the channel flow. And here we have a channel matrix rule. And now what's nice about decisions is that the, we have both the workflow as well as the rule engines that work in tandem together. So this matrix rule is one example of a rule that we can use in decisions where you can actually look at evaluating multiple rules. So in this case, we were looking at the selection that was made on the channel on that form, as well as any lead costs that may have been selected. And depending on those selections, the intersections of those items. So for instance, if we had a realtor as our channel and the lead cost was mid to, uh, to low or low mid cost, 
we're going to be outputting approved realtor. Now, of course, we can edit these very easily. So maybe if this wasn't approved, I could change this very quickly to not approved realtor. And now that change has been made. So, so as someone who's tried to build, sorry to step on you, Veronica, I no just have to do this here because this is a piece I really love is that uh, this kind of rule set and the ability, I mean, we've got a simplistic table here, but you can build these uh, these types of matrix rules as big as you want to. And in lending, for things like scoring and product eligibility and pricing, this is an ideal way to express that. And it's an ideal way to express it in a way that could be modified by risk guys or underwriting managers. So uh, this is a tool that um, you know, I had to write by hand in Java and that was excruciating. This is a heck of a lot easier. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm going to point out that I don't have a technical background. I, I've never had to write any code. I'm not going to be someone who's going to be easily going into a JavaScript and figuring something out or even going into the SQL and knowing what to do to uh, do a SQL query. However, I'm very easily and more than capable of coming in here and maintaining a rule such as this one. Now, we've made these constants, but I will point out that constants actually the drop down you can actually pull this information maybe it's something that you want to pass within your workflow or you can even run converter flows that you can do mathematical calculations in or even pull data from an external system to be able to populate this information now i'm going to jump out of this one and actually not save it so i'm not changing it but once we run that matrix rule we then look at the output that it provided and use a string match step to determine what path do we take and those paths are going to determine if we're going to do a calculation, create a rejection reason, if, if of course they're going to reject, or even create the lead name. Now, I'm not going to go into all of these subflows. Some of the other steps that you see, like those steps in red and in green, and as I mentioned in blue, these are administrative steps. So we know as we're on our dashboard or looking at our queue, exactly what state we're currently in for that particular application. Now, the last subflow that I really want to go into is this internal scoring and product eligibility workflow. This is a workflow that really is where all the magic happens. So here you'll see that we have a scoring system. This is another type of rule, and it's a rule set, in fact. And if I open that rule set, it's going to take me to another page where here I have a group of rules that we're running looking at the debt to income ratio, the FICO score, the income and the time on the job. And depending on those values, we compute a score for that credit score and to determine whether or not they're going to be uh, approved. Now, I'm going to jump into the FICO truth table. So this is yet another type of role here in decisions. Truth tables will allow you to um, look at multiple conditions. In this case, we're just looking at the FICO score, but if we wanted to add more conditions, we can simply add condition and it'll open up another column. Now, once again, we can enter these values in. Here, we're just looking at that range, and depending on what FICO score range that they fall into, that gave them a raw score. And once we go through all of these different raw scores, we ran a flow that actually takes in those scores one by one, looks at which type of score that it, it received, and multiplies it to give it a specific weight. So if it's a debt to income ratio, we have a weight of 0.15, but a FICO score is going to have a, a weight of 0.4. So we can very easily drag and drop steps, set up these rules, and be able to do very complex calculations without having to deal with any code. Now, I'm going to go ahead and close this. But, so that brings us right back here. There's one final step I want to show in, in this process, and that's the evaluate expressions. So this step here is a step where we can actually write out very complex mathematical expressions to be able to, to do a calculation. In this case, we were looking at the loan amount, the rate that was given, and we were taking in a, 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 you know, we're multiplying, we're dividing, we're taking a power raised to something. There's a lot of math, mathematics going on here. Now, if you have something that's complex, you can actually save things as a template. And in fact, this could be a step, this could be a form, this could be an entire workflow, but you can make things as templates to be able to reuse 
and give you a starting point to make it that much easier for your business users that are going to be working on these things to be able to build things out. And so if you know that you're all you're going to be using that ex specific expression in many different projects or many different flows, simply save it as a template and you'll have that. So I'm actually going to jump out of here. Like I said, I don't want to go in and, and go into every detail about how this one was built out. But what I'd like to do right now is actually go outside of everything and really show you what it's like to build something from scratch right here in Decisions. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to add a brand new folder. So everything I create is going to be in its own separate folder. And we're going to call this folder the New Realtor Edition folder. And when I click Create, that's going to go ahead and create a new folder in my project. Now, of course, when I create a new folder, there's not anything in here. But you'll notice that I do have buttons across the bottom, including Create Flow. And when I click Create Flow, I'm going to click Create, and it's going to give me a prompt to give this flow a name. Let's call this the New Realtor Flow. And when I click Create one final time, it brings me into our Flow Designer. So here you can see we basically start out on a blank slate. We have a start step in the top left and an end step in the bottom right, and that's basically it. But you will notice that those steps happen to have red exclamation points, and that's because our flow designer is completely self-validating. So it's going to let you know when you're missing information, or in this case, these steps aren't connected to anything. So if I actually make that connection, you're going to see those validation warnings go away. Now on the right hand side of the screen, you're going to see one of the tabs I have available to me is the steps toolbox. And on the steps toolbox, we're actually going to have many different uh, categories, but there are literally thousands of steps inside of here that we can use to create these workflows. So for instance, if I'm going to build out a new workflow, maybe I'm going to go ahead and start with a form. Many times we're going to start with a form that's going to ask somebody to enter in some information. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that form in. And of course, when I add a form into a workflow, we're always given two prompts. The first pr prompt is to go ahead and create something from scratch right now. And the second one is actually going to give me a list of all the different projects I'm a part of. And I can actually select a form that I've previously created to be able to use here. But of course, I want to go ahead and create everything from scratch. So I'm going to go ahead and call this the new realtor form. And I'm going to actually use a template because I created a template to save us a little bit of time. So when I pick my template, I'm going to go ahead into my lending demo form template and I'll click pick. And now I'll go ahead and click create. So here it brings me into the form designer, but I'm already one step ahead because I used a template. Notice I already have a, a form background on here. And in fact, I'm actually already added a style sheet, a cascading styling sheet. So when we run this in the flow, you're going to see that it's going to look quite a bit different, but really match those forms that we saw within the flow that Mark showed. Now, to create a form, we can simply drag and drop items just like we do in our flows. So for instance, I'm going to have, let's call this the realtor name. So I'm going to go ahead and add a label for each of these as well. The next item, I'm just going to add about five items here. So this one can be the Realtor email. We're going to also have a text box for a client name. And for the client name, I'm actually going to go ahead and select this to be output only. What that means is I'm expecting someone to type this in. With these previous two, I'm actually going to populate the Realtor name and the Realtor email with information I already have available to me in the flow. So I'm leaving those as is, but for the client name, I'm going to do that a little bit different. Now, well, um, one last one, property state. We're going to go ahead and have the property state. Again, that's going to be something I expect someone to type in. But I also would like to add a quick watermark. So please enter the two-character abbreviation. So I want to make sure that they use the two-character state abbreviation on that one because I'm actually going to use a rule to look at the, that component. Now the last item I'm going to add here is going to be an estimated loan amount. And of course, a loan amount is going to be currency. So you'll notice that I have the ability to actually search 
the form controls to find the exact component I'm looking for. So of course here we have currency available, but you have number boxes available as well. And we're gonna call this the estimated loan amount, if I could type. And there's that. Now the thing with the estimated loan amount, I am gonna have that as output only. I would also, I'm gonna point out over on the properties panel on the right hand side, you can change that currency symbol. So if you're not in using US dollars, if you wanna use the pound symbol, or if you want um, to have whatever other currency you might want to be using, you have the ability to change that. I also can realign those numbers. I like my numbers to be shown on the left closest to my currency value. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that. And I also am gonna uncheck auto populate. We can, we're very flexible on, on these forms and letting you all set them to make, uh, let them be exactly what you want them to be. So you have a lot of options available to you. But once I'm happy, I'm gonna hit close and save. And what you're gonna notice is I'm gonna go from that form designer right back into our flow designer where we left off a few minutes ago. So now I have my form, but you'll also notice that I have a submit path coming off of that form. And that's because I had a submit button on the form. And this allows me to be able to define exactly what I want to happen when they click submit. So when I drop that into some empty space, this dialog pops up with this, which is just the steps toolbox. And here, maybe I'm gonna go ahead and run a rule. And when I, when I run this rule, maybe this is gonna be the check, um, if state is in list rule. So we're gonna go ahead and add this rule. And once again, I'm given those same two prompts. Is it something we wanna create now or reuse something we've previously created? And in this case, we're gonna go ahead and create it from scratch. So this is yet another type of rule we have available to you in decision. This is a typical if then statement rule. So at the top, you'll notice I can set up any input data that I want to evaluate. And because we don't necessarily have to use a workflow to utilize our rules here in decisions. I'm going to go ahead and define that property state, which is a, some text, is something I want to evaluate. In the if statement, I'm going to be able to see the items that I provided, as well as flow information and any other lookup list that we've, we've allowed uh, for me to be able to view, and I'll select that. And what's really nice about decisions is that when you select something to evaluate in a rule, Decisions recognizes the type of data you select and it's gonna give you verbs that pertain specifically to that type of data. So because this is text, I'm seeing things like contains or starts with, but if I had selected a number, you're gonna see things like greater than or equal to or less than, those sorts of things. Now I'm checking if this is gonna be in a list, so that's what I'm going to select. And here, I'm gonna go ahead and type in a list of of items that, or of states that I'm eligible to work in. Now again, this is a constant list. This could be dynamic. You can pull this data from a workflow. You could pull it from an external system. But for simplicity, for demo purposes today, I'm gonna leave it as a constant list. We also have it set to a logical rule. So you'll see that over on the right-hand side, which means it evaluates true or false. But we have rules available to be able to return either a single piece of data or multiple pieces of data or you can even have rules that kick off workflows and take an action depending on how it evaluates. But I'm gonna go ahead and hit close and save. We'll leave this as a logical rule, which brings me right back to where we left off in our workflow. And now I have a true path and a false path. So here I'm just gonna take a couple minutes and say if it's true, if they are in a state where, um, that we work, maybe I'm gonna show a congratulations pop-up. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a pop-up and once again, when you add these different steps, you're gonna have a couple of items that you need to configure. So for a pop-up, I wanna know where's the location, where do I want it to show? I'm gonna have it show right in the center of the screen. I'm gonna make the subject a constant saying con um, congratulations. And maybe for the message, I'm gonna go ahead and use our text merge editor. And so this allows me to actually type in a message and when I type in that message, I can also use data that we're collecting within our flow. So here, I'm gonna say, and I just copied and pasted to save some time, your referral is approved. We'll send you an email with a link to our online application that you can forward to your client. Thank you. So we'll go ahead and hit save, and that step's ready to go. So now, after that, that pop-up, maybe we'll quickly send an email. 
So I'll select my email step, and here with my email, just like any other email, you're going to need to define a couple of items here. Who is it sending from? Who is it sending to? What's the subject and what's the body? Now, for most of these, I'm going to go ahead and set them as constants. For who is it sending to, I'm actually going to go ahead and select an item from the flow. We, we're collecting the realtor email. And so I'm going to actually use that information as who it's going to get sent to. For the subject, link to loan application. And for the body, I'm using that same text merge editor that I used a few minutes ago. So we can say here, oops, here is your, um, the link to our online loan application. Now, where do I get the link so that I can actually call this workflow, the workflow that Mark showed a little bit ago, where do I actually get that? Now, what's nice about decisions, now I actually have a, another tab open so I can get over here very quickly. I'm gonna go back into that loan approval that we just saw a few minutes ago, but all of our items are gonna have integrations at the top of the screen. And when I click integration, that's going to allow me to make a couple of selections. So this time I'd like to be able to see a form. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. I'm going to use a name session. This is like using a worker account, so I don't have to necessarily log in or worry about who's, who's clicking on there. And I'm going to go ahead and say, let's center that, that form and use whatever specifications that it was built to show. And then I click generate UI code. That's it. I just make a couple of selections, click the generate UI code, and that provides me a URL that I can place anywhere to be able to kick off a work, that workflow. So now if I go back into, let's go back to our flow, I'm just going to paste this. Now this of course is a long URL. We actually do have steps available so that you can change that URL to say, let's say loan application. So it would take you there, but not necessarily show you that long, huge URL. Now, for the false path, we're going to do one final pop-up. Let's just say, um, sorry, dot, dot, dot. So for this pop-up, we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're going to put it in the center. We're going to have the subject saying, we're sorry. And for the message, let's go ahead and use that text merge editor. And this time, but it, let's go ahead and let me copy this so I can paste it very, very quickly. Thanks for your referral, but we don't make loans in the requested state. And I'm going to go ahead and hit save. So that step's ready to go as well. So the final thing I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and take that done path to our end step. I have a thing about having straight lines, so I'm just moving that down a little bit. And the last thing I need to do is worry about where's the realtor email and the realtor name coming from. If you remember, I didn't change those to output only. What I'd like to do is actually map in where this information is coming from. And so here, I have that flow data. I'm already logged in. I want to take the initiating user email and the initiating user full name and pre-populate that information on that form. So they don't have to actually type that information in. We already have it available to us. And now that I have this flow, all the validation warnings are gone, we can test our flows by clicking a debug link. And when I click debug, I'm going to hit play. I'm going to see exactly what the end user would see. So here you can see it populated my name as the realtor name. The realtor email is the e email address that I, of my own. My client name maybe is going to be Tim Smith. Let's go ahead and use Virginia since that's where I'm at right now as my property state. And I'm going to go ahead and type in 5000 for the estimated loan amount. Now when I click submit, we're going to see a couple of things happen. Number one, you're going to see that I'm seeing that pop-up that we created earlier. Congratulations, your referral was approved. It hit that rule. Let me go ahead and hit dismiss. You're going to be able to see the path that it took. So you can see it highlighted in orange. Each step that took action shows a number indicating how many times it took action. And if you click on any particular step, you can see how long those actions took to take place and also view any input or output that might have been provided on it. Now, if I jump back over to my email, let me go ahead and refresh my email. There we go. Here's that um, email that I just created. So we have a link to, the app, to that loan application, and if I click that link, it's going to automatically pop up the loan application, and I can go ahead and actually start typing things in 
when I hit tab, there it automatically populates. So I could go through that same thing that Mark went through earlier. Now, as you can see, when I'm going through and, and building out these flows and decisions, I strung together a series of steps. I made a couple of configurations, and I had a completely working application without having to write any code. And so for people like myself that are really those business users that are aware of the process, understand how it should go, but I can't necessarily write the code. And if I need to make a change, we don't want to have to spend six months looking through code to determine how do I make that small change to this process. We can come in here and simply drag and drop a step and change that process in just seconds as opposed to weeks or months. So I think I'm going to go ahead. Um, one last thing I'm going to show, we have, we built this out. I just want to show one final thing is that we can actually reuse this. Although I put this in its own, its own folder, if we actually go back to our main flow. Let's say I wanted to add that flow into this other workflow. So here, maybe I'm just going to go ahead and add that, that subflow right here. So we could run a subflow, um, run new realtor flow. I'm going to hit add, and once again, it gives me a list of all of the items that I have permission to view and use. I'm going to select my new realtor flow, and now, just like that, when it, if it takes that path, when it hits the step, it's going to go into that flow that we created a few minutes ago. And if I go in and say edit flow, you're going to see that same flow we just built. So very, very quickly, very easily, you can make changes, you can reuse items as you, as you need them, uh, and you don't have to worry about dealing with that code. So if I'm not sure if we have any questions. Uh, that pretty much is the end of my portion here today. So if, I know there's a handful of us out there. So if you have any questions that popped up as we were going through, feel free to enter those in the Q&A portion of our Zoom. And if you have any questions after this, um, you can contact us. You can, we, I, I am Mark at decisions.com. So just give mm -hmm. me a call, just shoot me an email whenever you're ready. If not, I don't see any questions. So thank you all for your attending. I appreciate your time. Um, and as I said, I hope it was worth your while. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone.